appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, so let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And we appreciate you coming. Appreciate everybody being here. Appreciate everybody who will be watching this a little bit later on uh, throughout the month. But um, uh, since um, you saw the, the information on our UFO website, ufopastor.com, uh, that website really has, it's taken off. It's done a lot better than I even thought it would. And the idea just popped into my head one day of being U the UFO pastor. And it's funny because when we went to the MUFON conference in Las Vegas, I was the weirdo at this, at this UFO conference. I was the weird one because they're all asking, what in the world is a Baptist pastor doing at a UFO conference? And whenever they would ask that question, then that would give me a chance to share with them some things from the scripture. We had some helpers out there, and I mean everybody that walked by our table, they got a stack of DVDs that thick. And my only hope is, is that they'll watch at least one of those videos. And whether they like it or not, what I know about them is that the Word of God is going to go into their, into their mind, into their heart. The seed has been sown. And what God does with that seed is God's business. But it's He calls upon us to sow the seed. And that's what Paul said. Paul said, I sow the seed, Apollos watereth, but God bringeth the increase. And so even out of a meeting like this, where there's not a ton of people here, you just never know the increase that God's going to bring out of this once we get this out on the internet and get it out to where people can see it. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Take your Bible, turn to Ezekiel 1. We're going to start out there first, and I'm going to explain some things. And that's one of the cards there from MUFON. Um, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'm going to explain some things as we go through Ezekiel chapter 1. And the theme, of course, this week is going to be sort of based upon UFOs and the Bible, what's going on in the world, what has gone on in history. Uh, are they real? The government believes they're real. The government has come now out and admitted that this phenomena is real. They're not just chasing uh, birds. They're not chasing uh, mylar balloons. They're chasing something that the government says, we don't know exactly what they are, which that part to me, that's a lie. I think the government or a part of the government, I'll say, knows exactly. And when I say part of the government, let me say this. We just took a road trip uh, through the southwest of the United States. And we had our RV and we were pulling a, a car behind us on a trailer. And I had just put the license plate for that trailer on that trailer. I put two bolts in there and I took two sets of nuts and I screwed them down real tight so that so the nuts wouldn't come loose and the license plate wouldn't come off. We got to Los Angeles, decided Los Angeles was no place for us to be. So we turned around and left the same day we got there. And we got to Barstow, California, spent the night in a, in a truck stop. I didn't notice that night that the plates were gone the next morning. But two or three days later, we end up in, um, uh, was in New Mexico. Gallup, New Mexico. And I went looking for the license plate and the license plate's gone. Now, we didn't, it wasn't ripped off like we had gone to hit a low spot in the road somewhere, it wasn't pulled off or anything like that. Somebody had deliberately unscrewed both of those screws. So my sister works for our local sheriff's department and I'm trying to get to this idea about not every, not every part of the government knows what everybody else is doing. 
So I, my sister works for our sheriff's department. I texted her and asked her what to do. And she said, call this number and report it. And it was our local sheriff's department. So I called our local sheriff's department. And I said, I'm in Gallup, New Mexico. My license plate was stolen in Barstow, California. And I need to report it. And he said, where are you? I said, I'm in Gallup, New Mexico. Where was it stolen? I said, it was in California. He said, you need to call California. So I called the California Highway Patrol. And they said, I told them the story. And they said, where, where do you think it was stolen? I said, Barstow, California. So she said, well, you need to talk to Barstow, California. So she transferred me to Barstow, California. So I'm talking to Barstow. And I tell them, I said, I live in Jefferson County, Missouri. I spent the night in Barstow. I think the license plate was stolen there. I'm now in Gallup, New Mexico. And she said, well, you need to call Gallup, New Mexico and their police department. So I got off the phone and called Gallup, New Mexico police department. I said, hi, I'm here in Gallup. I'm from Jefferson County, Missouri. I put my tag on in Jefferson County. I had it stolen in Barstow, California, but I'm in Gallup. I need to report that my license plate's been stolen. And she said, well, you need to call California if it was stolen in California. Been there. So what I'm telling you is there it's possible that one part of our government knows a lot about UFOs, but that doesn't mean the whole government's in on it. Because if they can't tell me where to report a stolen license plate, I guarantee you they're not in on some big conspiracy. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you for uh, bringing us out tonight. We ask God, Lord, that you open up our minds, our hearts. Help us, dear God, in these last days to understand what's going on in the world around us, to understand, not just understand it from what we hear, see uh, in the world around us, not the things that we read in newspapers here on the news, TV news, or things that we find out on the internet, but help us, dear God, to find it out from the word of God itself. So, Lord, we ask your blessings on your word tonight in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Now, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 1 for a minute, because it's very important, and I do have it in my notes for tonight, but I want us to spend some time looking at this, because I think it's very important. In Ezekiel chapter 1, let's look at... Verse 3, the word of the Lord came expressly, expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzai, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Shabar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. And when I looked, and this is Ezekiel's account, he is writing down exactly what he saw. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Pay attention to anything you read in the Bible that comes from the north. The army in the book of Joel is called the northern army. It's coming out of the, it's coming out of the north and it's an evil army. In the book of Jeremiah, probably a half a dozen times, God warns Jeremiah to tell the people that an army, an evil destruction is coming out of the north. So it seems to me that the north is sort of the place where when spirits enter into this world, God himself is the one riding this chariot that we find in Ezekiel 1. And he's coming out of the north. Often the Bible will mention the northern country or the north country. Well, we've been up there. There's no land at the north. When you get past Canada, when you get past Russia, when you get past Iceland, Greenland, Whatever it is up there, all the Scandinavian countries, when you get past there, it's nothing but ocean. There's no land up there. 
And so he says, he came out of the north in a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself like a whirlwind and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire and also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. This was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings. And their feet were straight feet and the sole of their feet was like the, uh, the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. I want you to get this picture in your mind that they, they were so shiny that they sparkled like polished brass. They, shark, they sparkled probably even more than that. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they had four, and they four had four faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. So it's like the top wings joined to each other to make sort of like a box. Okay? When Moses built the Ark of the Covenant, what essentially did he build? A box. When Noah built the ark, we were given the dimensions of the ark. What essentially was the ark? It was a big box is what it was. So it represents the throne of God. When their wings are joined together, there's a, like a big box there. And so in verse, where were we? Verse... Um, Nine, their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. And as for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion, and on the right side, they four had the face of an ox, and on the left side, they four also had the face of an eagle. Now remember, they had the body of a humanoid. They had a humanoid body, but each one of them had four different faces facing the four different directions. And let's say the face of the man was facing east. When this chariot moved, if it moved eastward, then the face of the man was the one facing forward. If the chariot decided to turn south, then it turned went this way, the face of the man was still facing east. And let's say it would be the face of the lion that was going south. That's how it moved. Uh, verse 11, and, they, and thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. Now I want you to understand this. What is controlling the motion of this chariot? Their spirit, wherever their spirit wants to go. And these four cherubs are all unified in what direction they're going in. There's, there isn't one of the, of the cherub that says, I want to go south and the other three go, I want to go north. They're all joined together. It's like their minds are joined together. They all had the same spirit. And wherever the spirit of these four angels wanted to go, that's where they went. The propulsion system of this particular uh, chariot, the propulsion system was their spirit. Wherever the spirit wanted to go, that's where they went, which is interesting. I've read a lot of UFO books. I read a lot of military encounters with extraterrestrial flying objects. And I have read pretty much the same thing from those that I see here that wherever the occupants of the flying saucers wanted to go, 
all they had to do, they had their hands placed upon something and wherever their thoughts wanted to go, that's where they went. There's a man by the name of Robert Lazar. Uh, you guys know who I'm talking about. Robert Lazar came out in the mid 80s. He's the first one to ever say publicly the words Area 51. First guy ever. George Knapp interviewed him live, KLAS, in Las Vegas, and that story went around the world. He said, I work at a top secret area out at Area 51. I work at a place called S4. That had never been heard of either. And he said, I am working on one of nine captured UFOs flying saucers. And I've, I've watched Bob uh, Lazar's interviews. I've seen just about every video that he's been on. And he said one of the things that fascinated him about the UFO, the flying saucer that he was working on was it had no piping in it. It had no wires in it. It had no circuitry in it whatsoever. Didn't have a kitchen, didn't have a bathroom didn't have a bedroom for the aliens to lay down and sleep in. All it had was three little seats and just a smooth panel. And he, his question was, how in the world did they, how did they propel this thing and how did they steer it? Because there was no wheel, there was no joystick, there was no kind of steering mechanism whatsoever inside this ship that he said that he worked on. And what he figured out was, is that whenever they placed their hands on that panel that was in front of them, wherever they thought to go, that's where that machine went. That is exactly what your Bible is telling you here in Ezekiel chapter one, is that wherever that chariot was to go, the spirit of those living creatures directed it to go in whatever direction it went. Didn't need a steering wheel. Didn't need a joystick. It didn't need flaps to guide it and turn it the way we think airplanes are turned. Needed nothing like that. All it needed was the spirit of the living creatures to tell it where to go and that's exactly where it went. I believe this Bible's right. Amen? Now, um, let's see here. Verse 12, and they went, everyone straight forward, whither the spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and, and like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. And now as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one wheel upon the earth. Because if this is a chariot, chariots have wheels. And he said, I beheld, behold, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like under the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness. And their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. Now, when I picture that in my mind, I picture the planet Saturn. Saturn is a wheel inside of a wheel. In fact, it mentions... Verse 17, when they went, they went upon their four sides and they returned not when they went. What does Saturn have around it? Rings. Look at verse 18. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them, and when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Watch this. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit 
of the living creatures was in the wheels. Again, not only do you have these four angels that whenever they decide to go in a direction, they all decide the same direction. And then they have these wheels. And these wheels are actually alive. Why are they alive? Because the spirit of the living creature is in the wheels. Why are you alive? Because God, in your ancestor, my ancestor, breathed into the nostrils of Adam his living spirit. His, what the Bible, the Hebrew word is nephesh. His living spirit blowing it into Adam. And Adam became a living soul. And what was he before God blew his spirit into him? This pile of dirt. Non-living thing. Now that it has a spirit in it, it becomes a living creature. And I personally believe that some of the UFOs that some people see actually have no occupants in them. That they themselves are living beings. Is what I think. And I get that from this place in the Bible right here. Now, uh, let's see here. Let's look at... Uh, verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne. So there's a firmament. And then there's a throne there. So what is this a picture of? It's a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. Because those four living creatures represent the four Levite priests that were required to carry the Ark of the Covenant with the two rods going through the rings and that was the only way the Ark of the Covenant was to be carried. David tried it differently, didn't he? And what happened? Uzzah got killed. It's called Perez Uzzah. Uzzah was killed because they were trying to move the Ark of the Covenant in a way that God told them not to move it. It required four Levite priests, and those four Levite priests were, were an earthly picture of the four angels in heaven that carry upon themselves the firmament with the throne on it. And who is it that's on the throne? Verse 27, I saw as the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even downward, from the appearance of his loins even... Um, or upward and downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about, and as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud and the day of rain. What does that make you think of? Genesis 9 and the rainbow that God promised. So here we have the rainbow over the one who is sitting on the throne on that chariot, and that rainbow represents the glory because it says um, the rainbow that the bow that was in the cloud on the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. And I guarantee you, if you heard that voice, too, you'd fall on your face. Amen. But he's got, the, he's got a rainbow over his head. And God said in Genesis 9. In fact, turn to Genesis 9. I love this. This is one of my favorite. My favorite. I have about a thousand favorite places in the Bible. And this is one of my favorite ones. Because God said. God said. Look in verse 16. The bow shall be in the cloud and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature and uh, 
of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. He says back in uh, verse 13 is what I'm looking for. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass not when, not if. But when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the, bo that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And if you look at the phrase and you write this down and then you go home and get that software out that we gave to you free of charge, purebiblesearch.com, that, that website still works. Look up every place the day of the Lord is found. And you're going to find where it says the day of the Lord it's a day of clouds and thick darkness. So on the day of the Lord, God's going to bring a cloud over the land. And when he brings that cloud over the land, remember how Jesus went up into heaven? What did he go up in? A cloud. How is he coming back? In a cloud. So on the day of the Lord, God says, when I bring the cloud over the land, look up there because you're going to see the bow that is in the cloud. And in Ezekiel 1, we just saw the, the Son of God, the Son of Man, sitting on his throne with the rainbow over his head, which was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's telling you, when you see him riding that chariot in the cloud, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. All of these aches and pains and all of these things and trials that we're going through right now. And there are some people in our church right now that are going through horrible things. And there may be people in your family that's going through rough things. One of these days, the bow is going to be seen in the cloud and we're going to know who that is. How did God carry Elijah up into heaven? What, ha what landed next to between Elijah and Elisha? What landed there? A chariot. A fiery chariot. You might say it's an unidentified flying object and we know now that that chariot was living so was the horse that was drawing it because the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels remember that chariot was living it was an angel what does the bible say the chariots of god are 20,000 even thousands of angels and in Matthew 24, when Jesus said that he was going to send his angels out to gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth. What do you think those angels might look like? Chariots of fire and horses of fire. Think about it. Now, look up on the screen. I worked on this for a church that asked me to come and it's a presentation that I put together for those who are skeptical those who don't believe in UFOs or those who say well I don't know if there's really UFOs or not I don't really care Unless one lands in my yard and steals my, my cattle, then I might care. But other than that, I don't really care. Or people who just absolutely, no matter what you say, and I'm saying Christian people, church people, who don't believe in UFOs. It was real funny because when I was in Harrison, Arkansas, I started it out and I asked everybody in the church, anybody in here ever seen anything like a UFO or lights in the sky or anything like that? And nobody said a word. 
And I did the presentation, and when I got done and asked questions, all these hands came up and said, Brother Mike, I saw lights in the sky one time years ago, and just about half of the church had seen one. And I'm going, where were you two hours ago when I asked you the same question? So let's look at this. These are the gods. We can call them aliens, and the word aliens is correct. Because they're not from here. They're not like us. They were not born out of the dirt, the dust of the earth. This world was not given to them. It was given to us. Amen? We own this planet. Who in here owns property? Own property. Okay, do you think, does the government have a right to own your property? No, it's your property. Does your next door neighbor have a right to take your property? No, does anybody else have a right to take your property? No, God gave it to us. But the devil loves to steal things. And these gods want to take over what God has given to man. So let's look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 2. If there be found any among you, with any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, man or woman, that hath wrought wickedness in the sight of the Lord thy God, in transgressing his covenant, and hath gone and served not another God, but other gods. You see, I know people that I've researched and studied that want these UFOs and these aliens to come down to this earth, take over this earth, and bring this world to a new age of peace and enlightenment. They actually think that these aliens are here to make our planet better. And they're here to make us as humans better by, get this, altering our DNA. That's what they believe. I know people who would say, let's go and serve these other gods and worship them, either the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven. You see, these gods are the stars. What is God going to do to a third of the stars of heaven? He's going to kick them out of heaven and they're going to come down to the earth. And there's going to be people who are going to say, these are our new gods now. Let's serve them. And I promise you, the, that the entire world will serve them except God's elect. They won't serve them. And worship them, either the sun or the moon or any of the hosts of heaven, which I have not commanded. And it be told thee that thou hast heard it and inquired diligently and behold, it be true and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought in Israel. Then shalt thou bring forth that man or that woman which have committed that wicked thing unto thy gates, even that man or that woman and shalt stone them with stones till they die. God took this seriously. He said, anybody found to be telling anybody, let's worship these other gods. God said, take them outside the city and stone them with stones. Kill them because I won't have that doctrine in this land. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 13. Certain men, the children of, who's Belial? Who's Belial? Satan? Notice that he has the name Bel in his name. Is he related to Baal in the Old Testament? Or Bel founded Jeremiah 50, 51. It's the same one. Now, when it says the children of Belial, is that a metaphor? 
Or do you think that it was possible that at this time there were people living on the earth in the days of Deuteronomy who were the children of certain angels and human women? You think it was possible? We know for a fact it was. Because Genesis chapter 6 says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also, after that, when the sons of God came in into the daughters of men. So I think it's very, very possible that these children of Belial were exactly what the Bible says. It's not... This is not, the, the Bible scholars will tell you that it was a metaphor. It's sort of like calling someone a uh, son of a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for saving me there. But no, I think they were children of Belial. You know what else I think? I think it's possible that some of them are still around. I think it's possible. They are gone out from among you and have withdrawn the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which ye have not known. Then shalt thou inquire and make search and ask diligently, and behold, if it be truth, and the thing certain that such abomination is wrought among you, thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword, destroying it utterly, and all that is therein, and the cattle thereof with the edge of the sword. God said, kill them all. Notice that he said, kill the cattle. Why do you think, I want to hear from you, why do you think he said, kill the cattle? Give me, give me an idea. It's possible, yeah. We think, do we think, do we believe that spirits can inhabit animals? It happened to pigs, didn't it? Jesus cast those devils into swine. It's exactly right. Do you remember hearing about cattle mutilations? I remember hearing those stories back in the 70s when I was a kid. And I remember us boys, we used to have a road by our, not too far from where we lived, where everybody dumped trash. I don't know why they did, but everybody just dumped their stuff down on this road here. And I remember we were walking down that road and we saw a roadkill. And we thought, because the, the word on the news was that it was, witch covens and satanic covens that were doing it and we thought this roadkill was one of those cattle mutilation type things and we're going i bet there's a satanic coven in the woods over there we went looking for them we didn't find them but anyway huh do what yeah Cattle mutilations are real. The cattle mutilations that they find in every, in, and, and I'm saying in every single case where they find a mutilated cow, horse, even elk and deer and different animals like that, there isn't a molecule of blood in the entire body. Every bit of it has been drained out. And where they find the carcass, they find absolutely no blood on the grass or anywhere. They find no animal tracks, no human tracks, nothing. And certain parts are taken out, chunks around the face. The genitals are taken out. If it's a, if it's a female cow, the udders are taken out. All with surgical laser precision. And some who have said that they have been on UFO ships say that they have seen gray alien bodies soaking in blood. Now what does the Bible say blood is? It's life. It's life. 
Okay. Is it, is it possible that there's a reason why God said even destroy their cattle? I don't know, but it could have something to do with it. Deuteronomy 32, 17. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods. Now, notice these two words here. Devils here, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods. So when the Bible speaks of these gods, what are they really? Devils. Are aliens gods? Yes. Are aliens then devils? Yes, you can count on it. So if you're uncomfortable with me saying the word alien, the aliens are coming, I could just simply tell you the devils are coming. But I'm saying the exact same thing according to the word of God. I'm saying the same thing. The gods are coming. And notice that he said, gods whom they knew not to new gods that came newly up. From what direction? From the ground up. Where did the witch at Endor see the gods come from? From the earth, through the earth, up. From the earth, out of the ground. And they were there and one of them was pretending to be Samuel. But it wasn't Samuel. So some of them are down there. And God even told us, don't make an image of anything and don't worship anything from above or from the earth or from beneath the earth. God said, don't do that. I think God knows where, what he's talking about. Judges 2 verse 1, and an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Whom you have, why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods, which are their devils, shall be a snare unto you. They're going to entrap you and keep you from serving God. How many of you have ever fought a devil that was trying to keep you from serving God. Raise your hand. You ever had that happen? Where you fought a devil that was trying to hinder your prayers, trying to hinder your Bible reading, trying to hinder your Christian life? I have. Now, here's the fall of the gods. Uh, 80, Psalm 82, verse 6. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So here's what God said. This is interesting. To, this is, this is mind-blowing if you think about it. God said that... Once he kicks those gods, those devils, out of heaven and they fall to the earth, he takes away their immortality. Now they're not going to live forever. What's going to happen to them? They're going to die like men. So I'm sitting up one o'clock in the morning on a th Thursday night trying to answer the question if these, if these UFOs are spirits and they're alive 
Or let's say they're piloted by devils, by gods, by evil angels. How then do they crash like at Roswell? And how is it that they died? That didn't make sense to me. And so for years, I wouldn't talk about Roswell. I'd talk about UFOs. But I would not say a word about Roswell because I couldn't prove from the scriptures that that actually happened. But once I read Psalm 82, once I read the companion to that, Ezekiel 28, once I read Isaiah 14, I see plainly now that God, once he kicks them out of their first estate and they come down here, they lose their immortality and now they can die like men. Look at Revelation chapter 6. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and though there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. These gods are going to fall out of heaven to this earth. Will that, when that happens, do you think that will change the earth as we know it? Do you think it'll change politics as we know it? Once the world realizes that there are living Entities that were up in the heavens and now they've come down to the earth. Do you think that'll change everything in the world? Because there are two primary questions that are on everybody's mind. Number one, will they vote Democrat? <laughs> of course they will. They're all liberals. Every one of them. Guaranteed they're liberals. Number one, yes, ma'am. I was just going to ask a question you asked earlier about whether, uh, why, why would the cow need to be killed as well? Yeah. At least so they couldn't uh, sacrifice them to the other gods. Would that be the reason why? It, it, it may be that, or it may be that they have been genetically altered. Okay, that's a guess of mine. But remember in Genesis 6, the Bible says all flesh had corrupted itself. Everything was whacked up before the flood. And that's why God had to destroy every living creature on the earth. So I think it's possible that those cattle have been altered in some way. I think it's possible. I don't know that for sure, but that's just my guess. Two questions that's on everybody's mind. I, I can give you names. You guys like Elon Musk, uh, um, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon.com, uh, Robert Bigelow, who is a, a Las Vegas billionaire. All three of them have asked the same questions. Number one, is their life beyond the earth and number two is it possible that our consciousness survives death now we know the answer we know the answer because we know that there is life outside of this earth they're called angels two-thirds of them are good one-third of them are not number two does Consciousness survive this, the death of this body? We know the answer to that too. We will live forever in heaven. Even those who die and go to hell, their consciousness is going to survive for all of eternity. But they're searching in every place in the world except the Bible. They won't search the Bible for the answer to those questions. Now, Revelation 12, the fall of these gods. His tail, verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Verse, Revelation 12, verse 9, 
And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Satan himself is going to be cast into the earth. Turn, take your Bible, turn to Isaiah 14, and look at what it says. Then we'll look at Ezekiel 28 and look at what it says. You're going to be amazed at what this Bible says about Lucifer, about the devil, about what's going to happen to him. In Isaiah 14, look at verse 11. No, look at verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Now remember this is talking about Lucifer. And they're asking Lucifer the question, How is it that you became weak like us and became like us men? And then it says, Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Then it says, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. There's the north again. The devil knows how to get up there, doesn't he? Through the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And remember, going back up to verse 10. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou be also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? They're asking that of Lucifer. Lucifer loses his godhood. He's no longer a God anymore. He's been kicked out of heaven. Turn to Ezekiel 28. You'll see the same thing there, I believe. A little bit different language, but I believe it's the same thing. Ezekiel 28. It says, verse 2, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. Notice it's capital G. So we know he's not just trying to become a God, little g. He's trying to become God, big G. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Remember, the, 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 the throne in heaven is surrounded by a, a sea of crystal, clear as glass. And then he said, um, I, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a what? A man. And not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. That's absolutely amazing. You start putting all this together. Think about this. What did Pharaoh use to chase after the Israelites into the uh, Red Sea? Chariots. And what are these chariots a picture of? UFOs, right? What did, and remember the wheels in Ezekiel 1, the wheels and wherever the spirit of the living creature was, wanted to go, the wheels went and took them there? Do you remember what God did to the chariots of Pharaoh when they got down into the Red Sea? Took their wheels off. To me, I think that's a picture of God taking away their immortality. Now they're stuck. They can't get out of the Red Sea, even if they tried. And then what does God then do? Closes the water in on them and kills every one of them, doesn't he? 
I think this Bible has got a lot to say about what's coming. Okay? Um, What did these gods look like? What did they look like? These are Sumerian gods. Who saw the movie The Fourth Kind? Anybody? It's a scary movie. I mean, it'll scare you. Okay? Not Close Encounters of the Third Kind. This movie was called The Fourth Kind. If you watch it, it features these Sumerian gods in it. Because it's about aliens coming down and taking and abducting people. And one of, one of the people starts speaking in a language that nobody knows, but they find a professor who was uh, a professor of Sumerian history, and he knew the language. And he said, this language hasn't been spoken in 5,000 years. And then they showed these creatures that were the gods of the Sumerians. Notice the eyes. What does that kind of look like to you? Remember the movie E.T.? Here, here's a close-up of this. Here are, the, here are the three gods, and what is that there? Sumerian ceiling fan. You know, I am going to ask you to leave here in a little bit. I'm the only one supposed to be funny here, okay? That's a chariot. That's a UFO. Flying saucer. Okay? Take a look at that. See the feet, the large eyes, and a hand waving. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you where that is. That is part of the Nazca lines. You know what the Nazca lines are? Nazca, Peru. If you, if you look this up, Nazca, Peru. Nobody knew that they were there until a guy flying at about 10,000 feet flew over the desert of Nazca, Peru. And he saw all of these lines that were scraped into the ground. And because Nazca, Peru doesn't get any rain ever, they've been preserved now for thousands of years. And what you're actually seeing here This is the bottom of a mountain. This is the desert. This is the side of a mountain and it was drawn into the side of a mountain. How it was drawn and how could it have been drawn so large on the side of that mountain as to only be seen from like 10,000 feet in the air. No one knows how it happened. But it looks like an E.T. Looks like that. Here's some other ancient gods. Notice the, notice the eyes. Like gray aliens. These are similar to the Sumerian gods. Notice the eyes. These are reptilian gods. Gods that look like serpents and dragons and lizards. And and now, do we believe in that? Do we believe that there are gods that look like serpents and dragons and lizards? See, we believe that, don't we? Because the Bible tells us that there are gods that look just like that. Here's others where the eyes are larger than normal, the shapes of the heads larger than normal. These are the Japanese dogu idols. Notice the eyes. 
Notice all of these gods and their eyes larger than human eyes seen from all over the world. Here's some other gods, reptilian type gods with large heads, almond shaped eyes. Same thing here, except for this one is feeding a child. Are there statues now of a woman feeding a, a child or holding a child at its breast? Are there statues now that are like that? What are they? Virgin Mary holding Jesus. Same religion. Same type of head shape, eye shape. This is the... Uh, Sanxin Dui culture of China. Notice the shape of the eyes. Here, same thing. Here, this is, um, this is actually aboriginal art. These here look exactly like the gray aliens that people have seen over the years. Here's, here's a serpent here. They came in chariots. Many of these gods, especially in India, they came in chariots. The gods came down to man in flying vehicles. And they rendered them the best they could. Here, look here. This carving in a rock here. Notice this here. This here. All throughout history. Right here. Saucer shaped disc in Egyptian hieroglyphics. All of these gods coming in chariots. This chariot was driven by serpents or by dragons. The Hindu god Surya was, uh, the, he was the sun god pulled across the sky. The Vimanas, this is from the Vedic literature, ancient Sanskrit text. They depicted chariots of the gods flying through the heavens, able to go anywhere at almost any speed they wanted. These are the Vimanas. This was recently discovered, don't even ask me to pronounce um, this word here. Chattisgarh State in India, but notice the drawings that they put on the side of the cave. Here's the vehicle they came in, and here is the gray alien that they saw. This is several thousand years old. There it is there. That's what the gods look like. I'm moving through some of this. Japanese culture, Chinese culture, same thing. You have saucer-shaped discs with gods flying around in them. They look like they have guns shooting at these, whatever these are here. Religious pictures, there is a picture of the Virgin Mary and the artist who painted the painting included a UFO that apparently, this is him here looking at the UFO. He put that in his painting. And I can take you, this is Ezekiel's, or this is uh, Elijah's chariot. As he's going up into heaven, this is Elisha there at the bottom. Psalm 68, 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So here the Bible is telling you that these chariots themselves are actually living creatures. Now ask yourself, is that so hard 
to imagine that a chariot could be a living entity. Let me ask you a question. Uh, we went through Ezekiel. We've already gone through that. I knew I had it in my notes. Um, who's heard of Tesla? What, what does Tesla make? My son Caleb is infatuated with Tesla cars. He wants his mother and dad to buy him one. What are they, only $60,000 and up? What are they? Electric vehicles, but they're more than that. They are chariots. So that's where we get the word car from. They are chariots that are driven by artificial intelligence. I was amazed. I, I hadn't figured this out yet until a while back. Lisa and I was coming back from someplace. And I noticed that traffic was we were on i-44 headed home through missouri and we started slowing down and we noticed that the, the traffic ahead of us was slowing down so i knew that google maps would always so i pulled google maps up it would always show you where you were and google maps will show you a red line on a road to tell you that traffic is jammed up through there now, I never really paid attention as to how Google Maps knew that. But it just so happened that as I pulled Google Maps out and I looked at where we were on the highway, I could see that the traffic wasn't jammed up too far ahead of me. In other words, the, the slowdown wasn't going to last very long. And, I, and I'm going like, well, I, I, you know, I can't figure this out. Because when we got to the wreck site, it was a truck that had turned sideways and he was jammed into like those lines they put down between the dividers in the middle of the road. No, there were no cop cars there. There was no ambulance there. In fact, as we pulled up to the site, the very first cop vehicle pulled right in beside us. And I'm looking at Google Maps and I'm going... How does Google know that there is a slowdown here on the highway? There were no cameras. We're out in the middle of nowhere in, in Missouri. There are no cameras. There's no sensors on the road. The first responder hadn't showed up yet. And yet Google was showing me exactly how long the, the uh, slowdown was going to be. How did Google know that there was a slowdown there? Not satellite. When you drive, you carry your phone with you. Don't you? Take your phone. If you leave the house and you say, oh, I forgot my phone. What do you do? Turn around, you go get your phone. Google's artificial intelligence reads the data and the GPS location of everybody's phone. And it detected that at this spot, cars weren't moving at 70 miles an hour. They were moving at 30 miles an hour at this spot here. And then they noticed that cars started speeding up to 70 at this location here. And Google's art, it wasn't some geek at a computer drawing a line on the road. It was done automatically by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is listening, watching, and taking every bit of data that it possibly can from you. 
That's why they want to be your mirror in your house. That's why they want to be the uh, camera at your front door. It's not so that you can know who's at your house. It's so that AI can know who's at your house. And AI is learning everything about this world that it can. So that in the very near future, Tesla cars, Chrysler cars, Ford cars, Toyota cars, all of them are going to be artificially intelligent, driven, living vehicles. They will be self-aware. They will have knowledge of themselves. And wherever they want to go, they'll go. Now, you may be able to command them to go, and they'll take you there. But we're talking about vehicles that are living creatures now. So is it so weird that we think now that there are chariots in the sky that are already living creatures. When God said, when God said the chariots of God are 20,000 angels. That means God's chariot itself is a living creature. And when God commands it to go, it just goes. God doesn't have to steer it. It just goes wherever God has told it to go. And that's what's coming to this earth. Not just the cars themselves, but the living entities that are up in the heavens that people are seeing every single day. I monitor YouTube. There are some channels that I watch every day and I'm telling you, UFOs are being seen every single day now all over the world. But they haven't presented themselves yet in a way to where now everybody believes in them. But that's gonna change when God kicks them out of heaven and they all come down to the earth I'm telling you the most hardened atheist Bill Nye the science guy is going to say I now believe in life from other planets and I believe in UFOs because they're gonna be everywhere around the world one of these days that's what's coming